Hi everybody, my name is Hannah and this is Pepper and Pine and today I have a curriculum review to share with you. This is for our Ocean Main lesson block. Now this is a block that I chose to write on my own and so I needed a lot of additional resources in order to put this curriculum together. It lasted about six weeks and I'm going to share with you a little bit about the process I went through as well as review the materials that I used. We have books, we have games, we have kits, we have handwork projects. So I'm going to let you know some of the things that are worth buying and some of the things that you might as well just pick up from the library and then some things that you can just skip. And I also have my son's main lesson book here. I did go ahead and bind that. I have a video on how I did that. It, it's really packed. Even though this was only about 20 lessons, it did last longer than the time that I had scheduled this main lesson block for. And then on occasion, there were times when my son had multiple entries for one lesson. And so those took multiple days in addition to just the the normal time that it takes in order to do a main lesson. So let me just tell you about that really quickly. For a main lesson, generally it is a multi-day uh, lesson or multi-day activity because there is the opening activities for each lesson, there is the review period, there is the drawing or the narration, and then there is the new content. So generally those things need to happen over the course of about two or three days. It just naturally happens that way. It doesn't make a lot of sense to do the new lesson and then right away do all the content for that. It works a little bit better if you can spread that over a couple of days. So some of these lessons ended up being really long lessons and that's just the the way they worked out. And so whereas they're in the curriculum for a single day, they usually could require at least two days. And then in addition to that, you're doing new content while you're doing review content. And then you're also doing your drawing and then you're doing your narration. So all of that together takes several days. Okay, so I'm gonna put this aside. I'll show it to you a little bit later on in this video. Let me dive into the handwork projects first because these were a lot of fun to do. I have tutorials on how we made all of these except for this little penguin here which we made previously and I had intended to do them again for this unit since we had lessons on penguins but we didn't get around to doing it but I want to show it to you anyway because it makes a really great handwork project for that particular lesson. We also made some knitted octopus octopods octopuses, uh, but not octopi. <laughs> and so this was really simple. Actually, it might look complicated, but it's not. All you need is a square, knit a square, and that's it. And then these twizzles are really easy to make. And then this is the one that my son made, and my mom was here while we were doing these, so she made one too, which was really cool. Then we also made sea stars, and these are really easy to do, especially if you skip all of this detail. It just, you can whip it together in no time. It's a very great, easy beginner stitching project, and so I would highly recommend you do this. You can easily make your own pattern for this. It was very simple. This is one that I made. Can you even tell which one is my son's and which one is mine? Like, he did such a good job. This I made my own pattern for, and it actually... I, I kind of dreaded the process at first, but it actually ended up being pretty easy. Uh, I have a video on this as well. So I went ahead and I hand drew what I wanted. Then I cut it out while I was cutting out the felt for the project. And then we did a really simple stitch and then filled it. So super easy. I highly recommend doing some handwork projects for, for any of your units. It's just a, a great afternoon activity. So I have more of these types of videos for this unit versus our day-to-day -day lessons just because I spent so much time writing the curriculum. I didn't have a lot of time to film some of the other details of our day-to-day -day lessons. Uh, I make use of a lot of kits for all of our main lesson blocks and all of our unit studies. This one I absolutely loved. It didn't come this way. I arranged it this way. I have a video on this, so I'm going to just link that here and down below so that you can take a look at it. This is the seashell making, a uh, seashell bracelet making kit, and it also comes, it com comes with everything you see here except for this top row. These are our own shells, but it comes with all the materials that you need in order to make this of bracelets as well as some really wonderful samples here. Oh, these were from a separate kit, but still all from Nature Watch. So highly recommend this kit. I think it was affordable and it was a lot of great fun for my kids. Here's one little thing though. We set this all up while we were getting the whole unit together and my kids enjoyed 
kind of exploring this far more before we actually started the unit than while we were doing the unit. So just a little interesting note there. I want to share with you the Professor Noggins games. We really love these games. We use this probably daily, not just this one, but we also used the Explorers and the Space uh, games as well. And I'll explain that in a minute, but first I want to just show you these cards. They're really beautifully illustrated and they come with questions on the back that have both easy and hard questions. And so when we started out this unit, we were just starting out with the easy questions. By the end of the unit, we were doing the hard questions. And what's really great about this game is that if you are playing with your kids, you can just start with the hard questions and let your kids do the easy questions and then it kind of evens out the playing field. But we played this game so much that eventually we remembered all the answers to all the easy questions. So we had to go to the hard questions and it was just kind of a nice challenge. So we use these for our opening activities. So with our main lesson, there's generally the opening activities, then then that can include games and spelling and uh, review materials and maybe just catching up on like some of your old uh, assignments that you didn't complete. Usually it should be something kind of fun, in my opinion, something that kind of gets you excited about that day's lesson. Uh, you could also do uh, some legends and fairy tales related to the content. I ended up finding quite a few towards the end of our unit because it, it didn't dawn on me to do it sooner. But when we were studying seals, we did the legend or fairy tale, the folk tale about the seal maiden. And then when we got to the very last lesson about salmon, I found some Native American legends about salmon as well as the Norse myth uh, salmon as well. So I added those in and that's a great way to begin the the lesson. We also use the Explorers and the Space game for Professor Noggins because we had a section in our main lesson block that included the Explorers because we were talking about the oceans and more specifically the ocean that we are close to, which is the Pacific Ocean. So we wanted to talk about the Explorers that discovered California and then we also talked about the Lewis and Clark expedition and that was that just kind of fit well with our main lesson. And then since we studied the tides, we went ahead and pulled this one out since we were studying the moon and the sun and gravitational pull. And so we just did this one to kind of change it up for our morning activities. And so we enjoyed doing that as well. And that also kind of is a preview to our astronomy unit that's coming up. This was new for us. This is called Earth and Science sorry, <laughs> Natural and Earth Science Flashcards. Now this is by Ibu, so you can bet that the illustrations are gonna be fantastic and they did not disappoint, they're really beautiful. Now we were not able to use quite as many cards as we wanted to just because this was for our, our ocean main lesson block and this covers quite a few more topics. The only thing is, is that these are super gorgeous but they basically just provide a little bit of content about the topic. And so it was hard to kind of use these in an interactive way in our in our opening activities. And so what we did was that I pulled out the cards that were pertinent to the information that we were studying. And then what I did was I handed half the cards to my son. We only ended up with about eight cards that were that were. Uh, relevant to what we were studying and what we would do is we would read the content without saying what it was and then my son had to guess what it was and then he did the same for me and I had to guess what it was so it was not cool it was okay it was at some t sometimes it was super easy and sometimes it was super hard depending on what the card was but it was just a nice way to make these cards more interactive otherwise they're just really beautiful they're nice to have on hand but I didn't find them as I don't want to say exactly user friendly because it's not exactly the right word, but I didn't really know how to incorporate them as well as as the Professor Noggins games, for instance. All right, there's another game that we tried out. This is the Lewis and Clark game. Now, I had a lot of Lewis and Clark material since we had intended to do it last year with our history units, and we didn't get around to it. And so it was really great to pull that all out. And we basically covered the entire Lewis and Clark expedition in about two or three days. So I was really impressed that we got through so much content in such little time, which in general, it takes us far longer. But we didn't read all the books that I had scheduled for that, obviously, because 
because I had it scheduled for a much larger unit all onto itself during our history units. So that was the game board. It comes with some cards. This game was like, okay, I think we need a little more time to work with it in order to have it be a little bit either more educational or more fun because it kind of lacked a, it kind of it was lacking in both areas. The thing is, is that these cards are gorgeous and they come with amazing information and content, but it didn't really apply itself well to the to the game itself. So I, I mean, the game is great, but it needs a little work in my opinion, you know, in order to make it either more interesting or more competitive or more educational. So I'm going to just try to rework this a little bit and try to work the cards into like some kind of different way to play it. Maybe, maybe more trivia based uh, in some way. There are, I have a number of books. I'm just going to pull this one out and show it to you really quickly because it keeps bouncing around in our units, you know, from one unit to another trying to be used and it's just not getting used. I wish that the cover was here. I got it from the library at, you know, I don't know, 25 cents or something. And it has some really beautiful illustrations and great content, but it's just not getting used in our homeschool. So sometimes that happens as much as I try to get some materials used, it just doesn't get used. These I picked up from the library bookstore uh, when they were having a huge sale. They were only a quarter they're just gorgeous beautiful books and we did use them quite a bit both for me getting content for the curriculum since I needed a lot of nonfiction books in order to build the curriculum and then it's also just a really beautiful picture book with a lot of great content that I could read because my daughter who is six of course participates in her capacity in all of these units and so it's nice to have something that is of interest to her we didn't need this whole book we just need the part on the polar bears for the for this particular unit we also had gone to a beach and picked up some of these. It was during one of our road trips up the coast of California, and we got some amazing, beautiful shells and, and other things. And then we have our little magnifying glass, and we just have this there. The kids like were kind of interested in all of these additions that I had to the unit, but not quite as much as I expected. Prior to starting the unit, I also made these display boards and it just added beauty to our place that we display the materials for our unit. And they liked it when I first made it, but they kind of, it's not like they went every morning and browsed at all of our stuff, you know, all of the materials and they just, it, 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 I made nice classroom decoration, but it, it wasn't exactly as, as inspiring as I had expected it to be. I still like it, I'm still gonna have it, and I think that when I store all this and I pull it out the next time we do this unit, or to be honest, we won't be doing this unit as extensively as we did it this time, exactly. In the spring, we might pull these out and just kind of spend a few days refreshing our memory, but we're not going to pull it all out and do like a whole new unit again. So I'll pull it out that time, they'll probably be, probably be kind of like, oh, I remember when we studied this, and oh, remember this, and that's gonna be just fine. So since we had a lot of our own specimens that I have collected over the years, I decided to do one that was very specific to our area and to the things that we have found locally. And so some of these things I found like probably 10 or 15 years ago, they were in our, like in my homeschool supplies. I had this basket here with other specimens and things. Uh, these are some oyster shells that we got at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. And then I had all of these little baggies here that had, oh, I pulled out most of them, that had some of these specimens that we had found uh, at the beach years ago that I just kind of forgot that was in my in my homeschool supplies. Anyway, I put it onto a board. I really, really like displaying the things like this. It makes great classroom decorations. I think that when you put it away and then you pull it out, there's an excitement again. Just because of the way it's displayed, I feel like be it's beautiful and it just makes these items a little bit more special than if it's just all thrown together in a bag. All right, so I had mostly chalk drawings for the beginning of this unit, but then eventually I started doing watercolors right alongside with my son. And so I just used, you know, did this on watercolor paper. This is 90 pound watercolor paper and it worked okay, but it's not the best paper for the really wet watercolors that we wanted to do. And this was just done on drawing paper and I probably should have done it on watercolor paper. 
And so it worked out fine for this project, but I'm thinking the next time we do a unit that requires this much water coloring, I might upgrade the paper to something that's a little bit heavier, but this is a great economy uh, watercolor paper. If you're interested in doing a lot more of these kinds of uh, projects or art with your, with your main lessons or just with your homeschool in general. Now, I have not bound this into a book the way my son has his bound into a book. I am debating whether I want to do that, but I just want to show you that when my when my son did his work, we went ahead and put it into this uh into a folder so that we could keep it all together and then in the back and I don't have all of them here but he, I kept his rough drafts just you know all in one space because I wanted to have it. So this was a really great way to store it until I could bind the um the whole book. All right, so let me take you to uh, the books now. Under the Sea made a really beautiful book for display, but we ended up not using it as much as we expected. And the reason why is that when I'm putting together a unit and I need a lot of non or a lot of content, like just a lot of information rather, I need something that's going to be a little bit more specific than a general overview because this is gives you a couple of paragraphs about the seashore, but it doesn't give you enough content about the specific stuff that we want to study. So this is nice as like like say a refresher kind of book or an introduction, but it didn't serve the purpose well for our particular unit. Seashore ended up being fantastic. It ended up being a fantastic resource, but not the best. I'm gonna show you the best resource in just a little bit. But anyway, so for me, the eyewitness books are kind of hit or miss. Sometimes they work out great for a unit, sometimes they don't. However, if you have a lot of them and you wanna use them, my recommendation would be to use them as a resource rather than something that you read aloud. Just a little tip. Shell is a really beautiful, great book that we had intended to use more of. We ended up getting a lot of nonfiction books in the library and just use those as my resource information. Pagu was recommended to me by Emily over at ARG Schooling. It's story format and it goes to the life cycle of a hermit crab. The pictures are really beautiful. I definitely add this book into it. So thank you, Emily, for suggesting it. The ABCs of Nature ended up being probably the best resource material for now two main lesson blocks that we've gone through, but this is definitely going to be a staple on our bookshelf. I'm going to refer to it a lot for upcoming units. Sometimes uh, you get a book like this, for instance, which is super beautiful and totally up to date. So you get too much of a general, just general overview of the material and then little captions that might provide you the content that you're looking for. But more often than not, this just didn't work for us. It's super beautiful. I'm glad that we have it. But if you had to, you know, choose between two resource guides, I would definitely go for the ABCs of nature. On occasion, there were parts that were just what we needed, but not enough of those times to warrant making this book of greater value than the ABCs of nature. So these are the kinds of books that we just had on hand. Now on occasion, I might offer these books to my son to read if I needed a little more time to prepare or he needed a little bit of review before writing his narration, then it was great for me just to hand over a book for him to read. And so I, this, this unit has lasted several weeks and so I have returned most of the books. Basically, these ones would be elementary age books. They are nonfiction. We basically use them in order to get the content we needed for the curriculum. So this is not something that my children were reading. This is something that I read ahead of time, wrote it into the curriculum, and then just delivered to the students either. Mostly it was me telling them about it and then to finish off the assignment, then I would read to them what I wrote. But primarily I was basically delivering the lesson. So I would read all of this. I would absorb the information. I would understand it and then I could tell it to the kids. All of these basically nonfiction resource material, mostly for me, a little bit for my son. Octopus Strange and Wonderful. This was a fantastic book. I intend to order all of the books by this author, Lawrence Pringle, and it's 
illustrated by Merrill Henderson. These were fantastic. Number one, the illustrations are gorgeous, and you know that I am such a sucker for beautiful illustrations, but the content was really great. It began with a story, or more of like a, a story format, and then it went into the content. And so I just, I loved it. I read these aloud to my kids. They really enjoyed it, and I learned a lot. So it really worked well as a resource guide as well, but it also was fantastic as a read aloud. So, and this is the one on sharks. There are several other titles in this series and it's definitely worth owning. The rest of the nonfiction books are definitely worth just checking out the library. All right, this was also a fantastic book. It was written in a story format and at the same time you learn a lot. So I really, really liked this book and I liked the illustrations and so it was a winner in my opinion, worth owning. We had a couple of books that my son was reading as we were doing this unit. So Island, Island of the Blue Dolphin was one of them. He can read through a book like this in two or three days. And so I had to have a lot of books available for him to read. Uh, he likes historical fiction as well. He did a lot with the Lewis and Clark expedition and Sacagawea since that was also part of this unit. And so he read a lot of those books that we had saved for, or rather we had purchased for our American history unit. So it was really great that it was included in this ocean unit because he got to read all of those books. The Selkie Girl, we had this book already in our homeschool library and this worked really well for the lesson on seals, sea lions, and walruses. This is an Irish or Scottish folktale about a seal that ends up on the shore when the tide turns and becomes a girl. And so we had this book. We also have an audio CD that has the same story with songs. And we've just had that in our collection for years. And so it was great to add this to that to that lesson. Now, because I was writing the curriculum, uh, I started to get pretty repetitive in my approach. It was content heavy and totally not lively. And so at some point, because I was just like, I we got to talk about this specific uh, uh, about this animal or, you know, the the anatomy of this animal it just it started to get dry and and you know and I can get pretty uh pretty critical about books when they're living books and not living books and I had created something that was definitely not living and so I needed to kind of remind myself that you know that this content needs to be delivered in a, in a more imaginative and beautiful way and so including the folk tale for the sulky girl or you know the seal maiden within or as an introduction to seals, sea lions, and walruses was a great way to bring a little life to that lesson. So I would just say if you're trying to do this or even with the curriculum that you already have, I would suggest just searching for legends, folk tales, fairy tales related to the content that you're looking for. And it was actually a little bit easier than I expected. So I intend to go back through the curriculum and do quite a bit of editing so that I can be reminded of those stories that would fit well with the content that we are studying. One thing that I did have every day was a poem that related to the content that we were studying. I used the Waldorf Book of Animal Poetry extensively in order to find those poems. It was a great book, had a lot of perfect content for our unit, so I really appreciated having that book on hand. The last couple of things that I want to show you are just some books that my son read related to the Lewis and Clark expedition. I had a lot more of these since we had these for a unit, and then we had geology underfoot in Southern California and assembling California and this was for our first lesson of this unit which had to do with geology and geography of California and this is also going to work perfectly as a transition into our next unit which is on mineralogy and so that's that's why originally I had created this ocean lesson block in the first place. Oh, there are, I'm sorry, there are just a couple more books that I want to show you that I completely forgot because they were off to the side here. Uh, more content for Lewis and Clark. Uh, these books are great by David Adler. I really like them. The picture books are really beautiful and they have just fantastic content, definitely worth owning. You wouldn't want to be the books, the whole series is fantastic as well. Kind of like a whimsical, silly kind of illustrations, but they work really well with the content. It's very informative. I've learned a lot from these books, so definitely worth owning. A few more for Lewis and Clark. And then whatever I could find that was picture book oriented for the content that we were studying, I picked up so that I had something for my daughter. 
and then a couple more here you know more like a resource and more like resource information then i pulled out three of these small one small square books this one's on seashore and we actually ended up using this a little bit but not as much as i expected because i had it on display and then i forgot about it so we read i read a couple of pages aloud and i wish i had used these more i keep this is one of those books that keeps making it into a lot uh, you know the series keeps making it into a lot of units and just keeps getting overlooked for some reason i'm i'm so disappointed about that and then for this one we only just did the part on the moon and the tides or rather just the moon it didn't have stuff on the tides in here and this also is a great transition to our astronomy unit which is coming up after our mineralogy unit and then we had coral reef and i didn't use this one quite as much since we didn't study the coral reef but there were other animals in here that related to the our lesson so we did use it a little bit and then ocean currents i got this last year or maybe even two years ago and this is our first time using it now the cover what is gorgeous and when i bought it i couldn't see the inside of it and it's probably better suited for a classroom setting and i did go through it and i did find a couple of projects that we wanted to do and we just did this one. It's called the ice cube demonstration. And it's where you have an ice cube and you put it in a bowl of salt water and a bowl of uh, fresh water. And then you watch how it dissolves. And I also have a video on this. And that was a great project. So I'm going to go through this a little bit more and see if there are other projects that we can pull out, even if we're not doing it during our, you know, this unit is over. At least it's something that can kind of be a refresher on the stuff that we studied, although we did not study ocean currents. Uh, then there was one more thing that I don't have handy right here, but it was an ocean kit and oh, I can just insert a picture actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, we did not get to that kit at all. This was a hand-me-down kit that I got from another family and I had wanted to do it. The problem is, is that since I was spending a lot of my extra time writing the curriculum, we weren't able to do as many of those other projects that we normally would otherwise be doing. And so we didn't get to those things, unfortunately, but doesn't mean we can't get to them at another time. The last thing that I want to show you is a project that we did early on in this unit. That is sea salt that we, uh, well, we had salt water from the beach because we did do a couple of field trips to the beach so I kept some salt water we put it we filled it up and then we evaporated it and then that was the salt water so uh that was kind of just a cool thing it was actually ended up with a lot more salt than we expected which was kind of cool and then the cool thing about it was that uh, on occasion we will use salt on our watercolors and so we used we had another beaker. We used the salt from the salt that we evaporated or the salt that we got from the ocean. And then we put it on our ocean main lesson book in order to create these really cool designs. I thought that was kind of cool. So let me just take a second really quickly to show you the main lesson book here. And then I used my silhouette cameo in order to cut these words out. And I just kind of like the way it looks. And I also use my sticker machine or to make these sticky, but I don't know that that's going to keep there permanently. So we'll see. And then I used my Heidi Swap cinch machine, I think is what it's called, in order to bind it. So it's a machine that you can cut or punch all of these holes. And I totally made a mistake when I did that. I have a video on that. You can check that out. And then you buy these coils and then you can bind it. So really cool alternative if you're going to do a lot of book binding on your own course you can just take this all to an office supply store and they will bind it for you so this was his cover page which he kept intending to do the entire unit and he literally this was the last page that he did in the unit so I thought that was kind of interesting so let's see if I can get both pages in here so this was the first lesson it was ge geology and geography of the Pacific Northwest where we kind of are although we're in Southern California but that whole area basically and then we went right into the uh, Sir Francis Drake three-year journey across the uh, the world. And this is when he found San Francisco, or just, you know, north of San Francisco. He landed there and claimed it. And so this was kind of neat to show the whole voyage because up until then, this was mostly populated by native american indians and then the spanish had a lot of this area as well but it was basically empty and then since i tried to make each lesson kind of relate to the next one so while they were coming down around south america they got to a point where they were extremely hungry had no food they ended up having to eat penguins 
I don't think they were from Antarctica. I think they were penguins that were in South America or the Galapagos Islands. And so then I thought it'd be great to talk about Antarctica and the animals that are down there. And then if we're going to talk about Antarctica, then we might as well talk about the North Pole as well. <laughs> so then we talked about the Arctic and the things that were in, in there and seals and uh, whales kind of were part of that lesson, which worked well as a transition into Lewis and Clark expedition, because when they finally made it all the way to the West Coast, they one of the highlights of their winter, you know, waiting out the winter before they could travel back was a beached whale. So I thought that kind of all coordinated. <laughs> At least that was the idea. And then we went in to talk about whales, since that was a nice good transition to talk about whales. And then we talked about uh, squid because squid and whales tend to go together and then once we got talking about squid we want to talk about other cephalopods so we did the the nautilus and then that created a, a lesson on math and geometry so then we did a lesson on math and geometry and actually the octopus came before the uh, nautilus but that's okay we did octopus after the squid but it just worked out better to arrange it in the main lesson book this way. And then we did uh, this other math uh, lesson, geometry lesson on the spirals. And then we did a form drawing on spirals, which went well with my six year old because form drawing is perfect for her age. And then we also did waves because that kind of related. And then waves got us into the tides. And this is an interactive project we have that shows how the sun and the moon uh, affect the tides on the planet. And so we made this all to scale, I think, if my math was correct. So we have the size of the moon and the earth and the distance between the moon and the earth proportional to the distance between the earth and the sun. So when you pull out this whole entire string, then you can, you know, additionally, you can hold up the moon right to your eye and then it completely cancels out the sun. That makes sense. So, you know, like eclipses and whatnot. But then it also shows the, the little bulge here. I use my silhouette cameo to cut the earth and then these bulges here to show how when the moon and the sun are aligned, you get a larger tide, so that's the spring tide. And when the moon is at a 90 degree angle from the sun, then the bulges aren't as pronounced because the sun also has gravity on the earth, though it's less than the moon because the distance is so far. And so then you get your neap tides, which are not as dramatic as your spring tides. So that was kind of a cool interactive project that we did. And then it kind of fits into the book pretty well here. So that was the neap tides and the spring tides and the tides in general. And that is what got us into Oh, the the tide pool so sometimes we would uh, we would make a mistake on where we were supposed to be drawing since these were all loose papers so we had to remember to draw on one side and then draw the next lesson on the other side and do the same with our narration on the paper and we'll, when we made a mistake then we had to put our lessons out of order so starfish came after the study of the seashore and the tide pools. So the tide pools and the moon kind of go together. And then we started talking about the animals that you have in the tide pools and on the shore. And so we did the echinoderms, which are the sea stars and the sand dollars and the sea urchin. And the sea urchin then relates to other animals. Then we did clams and mussels and crabs and lobsters and hermit crabs were all part of one lesson, but it's two lessons here. But in our curriculum, it's only one lesson. We have seaweed, we have sharks, we have salmon, and then we have pinnipeds, and those were the walruses, sea lions, and seals. And that is the end. And we made our own covers because I couldn't decide what to do exactly. And then I'm like, of course we make our own because that's what we do in this family, right? All right, so. Thank you for sticking with me uh, for this video. I know it was lengthy. I know there was a lot to go over. I hope that it was helpful. Let me know if you end up doing this unit or something similar. I would love to hear some of the resources that you have used for your main lesson block. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Pepper and Pine if you wanna see what we're up to on a daily basis. All right, thanks for watching.